My name is Melissa Chen. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. And we are in conversation with Rob Sherman of Meta. Welcome to RightsCon, Rob. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, housekeeping, as usual, ask your questions, post your questions. Don't be shy. I keep saying this, you guys are pretty shy. Post. You can do it five minutes into the conversation, and I will actually relay the question to Rob. So, um, just a little bit more about Rob before we begin. Uh, he is Vice President and Deputy Chief Privacy Officer for Policy at Meta, where he is responsible for managing the company's engagement on public policy issues surrounding privacy, security, and online trust. Uh, your team works closely with privacy and policy experts inside and outside the company, uh, along with the product engineering research and other teams to protect people's privacy uh, across the company's suite of products. Um, and you are also responsible for the, uh, you look at the <laughs> responsible development of new technologies like artificial intelligence and virtual and augmented reality. And uh, before Meta, you were an attorney representing Facebook back in the day and other tech companies on many issues. So you have a pretty big job. <laughs> What's top of mind for you these days? Um, you know, I, I do think I, I and the whole team that's working on privacy at Meta, we have a big responsibility. We're serving a global community um, that has a lot of different needs and we really need to work on different kinds of investments. I, I think the big things that, that we're focusing on right now, one is really building out our privacy program so that we're thinking about privacy holistically across the company. Um, and so I think you know by the end of this year, we'll probably have spent somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 billion on privacy protections across the company and really building that out so that that it's a, it's a systemic part of how we build our products every day. That's a really critical priority. Uh, another one is building technology um, to help protect privacy. So we, we talk about privacy enhancing technologies, but basically ways that we can use technology to enable people to connect and share with each other, but also have their privacy protected. And then you mentioned um, the work that we're doing on virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and AI. And I think all of those things are really critical in terms of you know thinking about the next generation of how we as a society will interact and making some of the some of the really important decisions about how we'll protect people as a part of those experiences. You talk about uh, building out capacity for increasing privacy protection. I mean, this is the elephant in the room, and I'm sorry, it must be some of your colleagues who are impacted by the rounds of layoffs. How can you do that when there are actually fewer employees at Meta today than there were a year ago? Well, I mean, the first thing I should say as, as, you know, a person who works at the company and as a manager, it's been a really tough, you know, it's been a really tough experience to have people who have lost their jobs as, as a part of this. I do think that, you know, we, even after, um, <clears throat> excuse me, even after the cuts, you know, we have a, a pretty large team of people across the company in lots of different disciplines who are working on privacy. And I think importantly, um, people from lots of different parts of the world. So we're not thinking about it just from a U.S. perspective. Um, and also people that represent different constituencies. Um, that's one of the big pieces that, that I think is really important and unique about how we do privacy is we really try to think about it holistically. The other thing um, that I think is, is really important and is going to be a going forward um, area of investment is we need to do a much more intensive job, and this is something we've been, we've been working on really over the past couple of years in talking to people outside the company um, and you know, understanding you know, whether it's advocacy groups in different parts of the world or government or academics, you know, what's the state of the art thinking on the problems that we should be solving that we haven't yet solved? Um, a big part of what I'm going to be doing and what, what our team is going to be doing is having those conversations because we will make better decisions as a part of that if we talk to people as we're doing it. I mean, you talk about um, talking to advocacy groups and certainly a lot of people at RightsCon are quite skeptical. Um, because, I mean, just as an example, you read these headlines about content moderators who've uh, worked either subcontracted or worked directly for Meta losing their jobs in Kenya, right, 150 or, or whatever. And, and that's a lot. That sounds like a lot. And so it really doesn't seem to square with what you're saying. Um, how, how are you compensating for just 
fewer bodies in the building. Well, I mean, I think the, the first thing to say, content matters, I, I think, are a really good example of, you know, people that are really critical to the community that we're that we've built and that and that people that we're, we're trying to maintain. Um, and so I think thinking carefully about not only the role of content moderators, but, you know, other people who are really essential to the functioning of the, of, of the service is important. And so, you know, we actually have a team of folks who are thinking about, you know, for all the content moderators around the world um, who, who do work to help keep our community safe, making sure that there, are that, that, that there are standards for how they're compensated and their working conditions, making sure there's mental health support because it's a really hard job, all of those sorts of things. We're also, you know, we talked about AI a little bit before, um, working on tools to use AI and other kinds of technology so that the people who are doing content moderation don't have to be exposed to as much of concerning content as a part of their jobs. There's always going to be a need for content moderators, but where we can use technology to help make their jobs better, um, I think that's really important. Great. I'm going to pause real quick and actually turn to the technical team. I don't know if they're able to check in. It doesn't sound like there is an issue. Um, no, I just lost audio of, of your audio in my ear, and I okay. wanted to make sure that people online could hear uh, what you just said. Okay. Mm. Let's double check, but the audio is good. Okay, great. Let's All continue. Right. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't want to waste your time. <laughs> no problem. Um, so there's been a lot of talk at RightsCon uh, the last 48 hours or so about the role of government, and certainly we've we've heard uh, a lot of mm, uh, headlines in the past from meta executives uh, to say regulate us. You know, government has a role to play. Um, talk about that. I don't want to talk about the United States angle because I think there's enough talked about, uh, enough discussion around the United States and, and the EU. But how do you think about that when you're engaging with other countries, say semi-democratic countries like Turkey or or India, where there are rule of law issues? Well, I mean, I think there's there's two pieces to it. The the first is it's really important for us to be us as a company to be meeting people where they are and recognizing that there are differences in needs of both communities and governments around the world, but also people in different situations. Because as you point out, you know, in some parts of the world, people have very different privacy needs, for example. And so, a big part of how we try to think about the decisions that we make is making sure that we're optimizing for you know what are the specific needs of different parts of the community. So, for example. Um, you know, when the conflict in Ukraine um, started, you know, there were there were some examples where people were being targeted because of what was informa information that was on their Facebook page, and so we we made some specialized changes to our product for people in Ukraine to help them protect their privacy. Um, and so that's something that we try to do pretty consistently, um, and and I think that's really important. And then also working with governments um, in different parts of the world to make decisions about, um, you know, how services like ours should be regulated because I think there you know obviously we have a pretty huge responsibility to build products that are that, that are good for helping people connect and that are responsive to the needs of the community but at the end of the day I don't think you I don't think anybody wants a company like Meta or any large company to be making all of the decisions about how things should work in the world and so a big part of it also is is enabling governments to make thoughtful decisions and and trying to support you know the development of laws um, in where, where we can now, in terms of speaking to advocacy groups, I mean, tell us a little bit about the process. I mean, uh, you're doing this in order to bring that feedback into the company and integrate some of the changes that people make in terms of suggestions or how they're personally impacted by the products. Yeah, so th this has actually changed quite a bit over over the past couple of years. So if you're looking back to you know the last in-person rights con in 2019, we've actually made a huge, a, a, large number of investments in, you know, a bunch of different things. This includes like having a broader human rights program and a human rights policy that's based on, that includes among other things, a lot of these consultations and, and, and talking with folks outside the company. So we have advisory groups um, in each part of the world, in each region, um, with privacy experts who we sit down with and we talk about our products before they're released and we get feedback from them. We also do that one-on-one -on -one with, with NGOs and individual experts who um, may not be a part of a structured advisory group, but who are experts on a thing that we really need to understand. And, and the goal of that is really to understand not only the state of the art in terms of what the advocacy community is thinking about, but you know what, what are the next questions that we're going to need to be solving um, as a part of building our products. And then I think the, the, the other important piece of this is um, in parallel to building out that structure where we have these advisory groups that are either regionally based or focused on a particular topic. So think about you know monetization or augmented and virtual reality where we have these groups of people that we interact with regularly. Also build 
building out the process within the company to make sure that we're actioning that feedback. So we now have this process we call privacy review. So every time we are building a new product or changes to an existing product that impact people's data, it goes through a review process that includes a cross-functional group of people to think about, you know, what is the thing that we're trying to do? What's the goal of this product or this change? What are the privacy risks? And you know, what might go wrong? And what can we do now before we release this product to make decisions to reduce those risks? And as a part of that, taking into account the feedback that we're getting from all of our experts around the world that we talk to, um, to make sure that we're thinking about these things. And, and you know, I think there are lots of examples where you know, we get feedback on, sometimes it's something very small, like you should explain this better and here's how you could explain it. Sometimes it's more significant and causes us to refactor um, the way that we're building products. But in all of these cases, really, the feedback is super valuable because it helps us do a better job for the community early on. And, and the way you do things today is not what you would have done it 10 years ago. No, I think that I, I think I think the company. I mean, I've been at the company for eleven. I think um, at this point, and it's certainly you know I think the company's evolved a lot during that time. The the world has evolved a lot during that time. But I think you know one of the things that I think is really striking for me as somebody who's been at the company for a long time is like you know I, t I talked about sort of the investments over the past couple of years. Um, it is really permeated the way that we build in a way that, you know, is different from the way it was before. I think it's a little painful for the company, to be honest, because it causes us to be slower. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to be slower to make thoughtful decisions. Um, but it's, it, but, but this is a core part of the way that we operate. And I think, I think on balance, it's a really good thing, but it is a different, a different culture than what I, what, what the company was like when I joined. Right. So mistakes were made, lessons were learned. Um, and, I guess I wonder, um, do you think there's a role for government to get involved? Because everything that you're explaining to me in terms of this more updated process that's more responsible, perhaps slower, but um, includes more stakeholders, is something that the company is choosing to do on its own. Um, and it's really incumbent on companies to choose to be responsible. Do you think government has a role uh, to play uh, with the process that you just described? A absolutely, I do. I mean, I think I think in, in a couple of ways. So first of all, it, it's worth saying, you know, some of some of the investments that we made, many of the investments we made are because of legal requirements, right? And so, you know, whether that's, you know, the you, whether that's our consent order with the FTC or legislation in Europe or there's new privacy law in, in Brazil, you know, lot, lots of these things are happening that require us to make investments, and I think those are important. So that's one way that governments can get involved. We also have relationships with regulators around the world, similar to what I talked about with, with advocacy groups and privacy experts, where we're talking to them about, here's something that we're thinking about building, give us your feedback on it. And I think that's, you know, that's another thing that we are increasingly doing with governments, even where there's not a requirement that we do so because we think it helps us get things more right earlier rather than waiting until there are problems. The the, the, the last thing, which is actually, you know, I just before I came to RightsCon, I was in Mexico, mm. um, and we are just finishing up a project that we um, have partnered with the Mexican Data Protection Authority, um, as well as a bunch of Mexican businesses and other stakeholders um, called Open Loop. And so this is basically what, what we call policy prototyping. It's a fairly novel way of working with governments, um, but looking at what's a new area of law or a new kind of technology that we know needs to be solved, and we don't have clear answers on, like, just do this, and as long as you do this, you'll, you'll be compliant. And so, in this case, we were talking about transparency around AI, which I think is a topic that, that lots of us are spending a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, I think the, the, the core problem statement is, you know, we all agree that it's important to make AI more transparent and to enable both people and experts to understand how data is being used and how AI is affecting their lives and their experiences, but we don't have a really good example of, you know, just do this and then that's what AI transparency needs to look like. And I think, you know, there are lots of examples, but I don't think there's consensus yet on that. And so what we tried to do is, is to, you know, in a prototyping way, in a sort of let's imagine based on the OECD and other authorities that have that have done thinking about this, let's right. imagine we came up with a framework for what AI transparency would look like. And let's try large company like Meta, but also smaller companies, and try to implement that in your day-to-day -day operations, and let's see what works. And so it's a kind of lightweight and easier to operate 
way than passing a law to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And then what you learn is, you know, here's some things that are really helpful and that consumers really value and that make transparency really good. Here are some things that actually we spend a lot of time on and didn't actually move the dial in the way that they should. And so um, the that particular project we have in, in the coming days, we'll actually have a report out on some of the findings from it. Um, but I think that is a non-traditional way of working with governments. But I think um, when we are working in a situation where we have an incentive to try to figure out a new problem and they have an incentive to try to figure out a new problem, it's a good way of working together. Uh, do you, this is sort of an internal company question, but I mean, uh, where do you see the most uh, resistance uh, within the company uh, in terms of departments in response to the suggestions that you guys are trying to push? Like, is is there, there's got to be a natural tension, right? Especially with the engineers who want to move fast, maybe, um, and, and you're always coming in as the, as the internal sheriff and saying, hold on, everybody. Like, how does that work? So that people have insight into the dynamics at play. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a good question, and, and people don't often ask that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, you're right that there is this dynamic where, you know, part of our job is to help product teams figure out how to do the thing that they want to do in a way that protects people's privacy, that keeps people safe, all of these things. And sometimes that means pushing back and saying, like, we shouldn't do this thing. Um, and, and I do think that there is a, a little bit of a natural tension there. And, you know, as I said, you know, our process has, over the time I've been at the company has become more formalized um, and that causes us to slow down. And I think there's less of a tension on, you know, this is a bad idea and just going through this process takes more time than if we could just go out the door. But I think as a company, we've realized, you know, one, we have legal requirements, but, but I think even more importantly than that, um, you know, we're now serving north of three billion people around the world, and, you know, we're not always going to get it right, but doing everything we can to be as thoughtful as we can is super important. So the dynamic for how this works is, I, I started to talk a little bit about this, but we have, you know, a typically a product manager, um, and, or an engineer, whoever's, who, whoever's working on leading, building a, a new feature, um, will sit with a cross-functional group of people, which can include you know, people from my team, um, people from our privacy product team. We have program managers that run the process, lawyers, communications experts, user experience researchers who can understand if we communicate this in this way, are people actually going to understand what we're trying to say? Um, so a whole bunch of disciplines come together, and obviously, depending on the complexity, it's fewer people or more people, but we really try to look at it from a cross-disciplinary perspective and say, you know, what are the things that we need to that we need to think about? And then there's a, a decision process where, you know, if there is a disagreement, I would say, you know, 80 plus percent of the time there's not. But then we have a, you know, sort of a, you can think of it almost like a, an, a, an appeals process within a court or something like okay. that. But there's, you know, so there's like a group that includes me and leaders from other parts of the company that make a bunch of decisions and sort of try to see if we can figure out from among the competing perspective what's the right way to do it. And then, you know, some, some number of times we can't resolve it or it's just a foundational enough question that, you know, Mark needs to be the person um, who makes the decision. And so very often we're talking with Mark about, you know, some of these hard trade-offs. I, I think a good example mm -hmm. of where this comes up, just to sort of illustrate it, because I, yeah, I know yeah, that like the process Yeah, because we're speaking feels, in abstract. Yeah, it's and, very abstract. Yeah. Like, you know, one of the things one of the areas where we often have tension is, and I think this is a healthy tension, but it's a tension, mm -hmm. is between our privacy efforts and our safety and integrity efforts. So, you know, almost by definition, under the work that we do to keep people safe on our platform requires us to understand sensitive data, right? So, you know, think, for example, about the work that we're doing on, um, you know, detecting whether somebody's expressing that they might be intending to harm themselves. And so we have an approach where if that gets reported or if we can detect it, yeah. that can actually go to a moderator who can reach out to that person or if needed, contact emergency services to get them help. Um, to do that requires us to process a bunch of data um, and to make inferences about people's situation, um, which is quite sensitive. And so, you know, depending on which side of the spectrum you fall on, whether it's more important to keep people safe or more important to keep data private, you could you could reasonably um, you could reasonably come down on either side of that and, and have a different opinion. The way that we have tried to approach those kinds of tensions, and again that's one example, but there are lots of them, mm -hmm. is, you know, 
we there is a tension, but that doesn't mean that we ha that that privacy has to come at the cost of safety, or that safety has to come at the cost of privacy, and okay. that just requires us to work a little harder. So, um, it, one one I, I talked earlier about you know our work on privacy enhancing technologies, right? And I think this is a place where that shows up really well. It, you know, for example, you know, using in in this case, you know, building infrastructure that segregates information so that we can use information about whether we think that there's risk in a particular post that somebody made that requires a moderator to look at it, but that segregates that from not being used for other things within our with, within our system. Um, we have been investing. So, in so just to back up and ex explain that a little bit, I mean, I'm imagining how maybe each each person has a piece of a puzzle, but they don't have the full picture. That, is that one right. way of like yeah, so, thinking so th about that data? Actually, yeah, there's, so there's yeah. actually two two pieces of it. One is just the infrastructure that segregates that data. So if mm -hmm. we make a judgment that this post might, you know, reflect that somebody's expressing intent to self-harm, right. the person on the team that deals with providing support to those individuals can see it, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has access to it or that other systems within the company will have access to it. So that's one example. But mm -hmm. the, the sort of pieces of the puzzle is, is another technology that we've been investing in um, called secure multi-party computing. Okay. Um, and so this is basically, imagine like you have one piece of the puzzle in an envelope, I have another piece of the puzzle in an envelope, and you know, we don't know what's in each other's envelopes, but we're able to put things together to, you know, to, to try to do something together. So um, an example of where this came up recently, we actually have a, a paper that we published about it is um, effort to combat racial bias okay. in machine learning systems. Yeah. So, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, I think we, we can all agree we want to reduce the extent to which AI perpetuates societal biases and these sorts of things. But actually, you know, our, our um, VP of Civil Rights he often says you can't fix what you can't measure. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really good example here. We don't actually have data on the ethnicities of people who are on our service. And so figuring out whether a particular model treats one ethnicity differently than another is not straightforward. Mm. And so going back to the discussion we were having before, we actually had a lot of conversations with both civil rights and human rights advo advocates and also privacy advocates. And obviously, as, 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 as you know, many folks fall into multiple pieces of those categories, really about what's the right thing to do here. Because I think in an abstract sense, you would say, well, I don't want Facebook to keep track of things like ethnicity or other, other sense of data. But on the other hand, this is a problem that needs to be solved. And if right. we can't, identify where it's happening, we can't solve it. And so we, we did a lot of investing in privacy enhancing technology to basically use this this secure multi-party computing idea, this idea of having different data in different places mm -hmm. that we can mash it together without any without us needing to know all of the race data, for example, where um, where we would be able to detect in the aggregate, is this particular AI system, is it having a differential effect on one group versus the other without us being being able to learn right. about individual people and individual people's situations. Um, so we're doing that, I think, you know, other examples in advertising and other parts of our business too. Um, yeah. But I think it's, it's sort of an example of where, you know, there is a tension mm -hmm. and you have to do some more work to resolve the tension, but you can, I, at least I would suggest, try to achieve both. Yeah, I mean, it's not super technical, but maybe a little it is pretty detailed what you've just relayed and, and important. And I'm also looking at the question box and I can't believe it guys, you have a senior executive of Meta and you can ask him any questions and no question. I can't you imagine guys are shy. nobody has well, questions. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm going to try to channel the energy okay. of this of this uh, of this place. Um, Maria Reza, Nobel Peace uh, recipient, journalist and, and critic of Facebook has said uh, in her uh, recent memoir, which I read, that um, she believes Meta is the greatest threat to democracy around the world. Uh, if she was sitting in front of you, how would you respond? That's pretty serious. And she's a serious woman and is a serious thinker. You know, when, when I joined the company 11 years ago, one of the big things that got me to join the company was because I believed in the power of technology to help connect people, to help people, you know, engage in dialogue and to discuss with one another and, and all of these things and, and to build community in ways that weren't possible. And there are lots of examples, whether it's, you know, <clears throat> people that want to express a political view, people that want to, 
um, get support for a health condition. You can think of all these examples where there are just communities that wouldn't have existed and that people have the ability to build community. I think that's true in, in political context and I think it's true in the social context too. So I'm coming at this question as a, as a, as a believer in, in the value of technology for helping us connect. Um, but I also- Why do you think she's saying that then? Well, I mean, I think, I, think it, I think it is absolutely true that in any community that's as large as what we're talking about, there are people that engage in bad activities. And, and I think, you know, part of our responsibility is not only to, you know, understand what those are and take action to deal with them, but also to understand the role that we play in, in enabling that. And I think just as, you know, being able to communicate instantly and for free with people around the world and to share your ideas can be extraordinarily powerful, can also be damaging. Um, and I think we've seen examples of that. And so I think the, the thing that I would say is it's incumbent on us and not just us as, as a company, but as I've talked about as a part of a global community to really think critically about both the benefits of what we're building and the risks and to make the investments that, that we're making. So I talked about, you know, spending five, billions of, $5 billion on privacy by the end of this year. We have thousands of people that are committed to that. We have tens of thousands of people who work on safety and security across the company. And these are investments that we need to make because it's important. Um, but... I, I mean, I guess what, what, then why do um, activists continue to be frustrated, you know, despite your efforts? Well, I mean, I, th I think, you, I mean, there, there are lots of people in the, in the audience who... I'm trying I mean, to channel should, them. You should, you should ask. I mean, what, I, look, I, I, personal view is, yeah. I don't think the work that, you know, we are doing as a community, right. like, or that, you know, I and my team are doing, I consider myself somebody that is advocating for our community and for privacy rights within the company. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who have that view. Um, I don't think that work will ever be done, right? I don't think we can say, okay, if we just do these five things, then everything will be good, partially because of their hard problems, partially because technology doesn't enable them uh, to be solved, and partially because people that want to have negative effects on the world are continuing to evolve in, in changing the way that they behave to get around whatever protections that, that we adopt. So I, I think it's right, you know, to be frustrated that those problems exist and aren't solved. I think sometimes, I mean, you talked earlier about the, you know, the, the headcount reductions and like the financial constraints that we operate under. And I think that's also a thing to be frustrated about too, because it means, you know, we won't necessarily solve all of the problems right away. I do think, you know, a big part of what we need to do is to show up and have the conversation and do everything we can and where we can't solve the problem, right. try to sit down and have a conversation about what we can do. Well, with just three minutes left, you do have a question. So oh, someone stopped being so shy. Given tension of safety and privacy and the use of the platform in January 6th or climate misinformation, what efforts has your team taken about national harms in the United States? So I think it's, I think it's important um, to think about both the role of expression, but also the w role that expression can have um, that's harmful. And I should say, I'm not the person, there are actually a bunch of folks on our team who do work on content moderation, um, who are at, at RightsCon, I'm not one of those people. Right. So there are probably other people to talk to about that. But I think it's a combination of understanding, you know, we have community standards that we've articulated and understanding where misinformation um, goes across the line and is, and, and, and is harmful to the world and, and, you know, taking efforts to take down and we talked about some of our AI systems that, that help with that but also you know understanding you know understanding ways to provide additional context where there's a debated question you know I think you know Twitter as an example has also been doing some stuff around community notes in this space where you know where there's somebody might say something and then there's additional context you might want to have so there are, there are a bunch of different things I think fundamentally you know people that are engaged in conduct that is trying to harm people is not something that we want on our platform or that has any any space and I think it's a, that has a place on our platform and we should be getting rid of that and we should be stopping it wherever we can. Um, but I also think that, you know, short of that, there are kinds of, you know, political dialogue and political speech that we do want to enable and, you know, figuring out other ways to make sure that we can provide space for it is important too. Cool. Any final thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I think I, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground actually in this conversation, yeah. and I'm excited. You know, I'm going to be be here at RightsCon, hopefully having a lot of conversations with folks. Um, I mean, I think the 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 thing that I would end on is kind of what I just said, which is, you know. The work that we're doing is never done. There are not, you know, there, there are clear things that I know the community um, has asked us to do and that we're, that we're working on. But I also think, you know, 
we're going to, just like I talked about the policy prototyping for AI transparency as an example, we're going to do a better job um, in the decisions that we make if we work together. It's why we and a lot of, why I and a lot of our team are here. Um, and it's something that I hope we can continue to build on in the coming years. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Melissa. And thank you for joining us in conversation. We'll see you at the next session, and until then, stay engaged. <laughs>